blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Thank you. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Apostle Paul says, writes, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. The children of Israel were given great and exceeding blessings from God, including the promised land. But it seems the more God gave Israel, the more ungrateful and hardened they became toward him. I had an experience this past week. Karen had to have another test done at the hospital there in Borden. And we come in, went through the outpatient, she went through the outpatient deal to get sent back to radiology. We go back, we're sitting there waiting. <clears throat> a woman comes in. She's an older lady. She's got her cane. The most aggravating, ungrateful, I, I don't need to know how to describe it. Nothing was right. Nothing satisfied her. She was there last week. Doesn't know why she needed to be there this week. She couldn't hear. So she spoke really loud. Everybody in the hospital could hear. She complained about the people who were there, the technicians and all. She talked to us a little bit. Her children were from away from her, or from away from here, to pretty much understand why the type of person that she was. She's never, never satisfied with anything. Karen goes back to have her test run. She's there, she's still griping, complaining. She quits griping and complaining. And one of the ladies from the office comes by and says something to her. And she says, okay. And she gets up and gets her stuff. And did she tell me to come back? I said, I don't know. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> well, I think she did. And I'll go, I don't see her. And she goes back hunting for this lady. And the lady hadn't told her it was time to go back for her test. She comes back. Oh, I don't know. I didn't sleep well last night. I, I, I wasn't paying attention. I was sleeping. I, yeah. Pretty soon she had the whole place in an uproar. And then they were coming and asking me, well, did your wife go back? The lady who was with you, did she go back for her? Yeah, yeah, she went back for her. They were trying to tell her, well, they'll be here for you in just a little bit. But the ungratefulness, there's somebody trying to help her to be healthy or to find maybe something wrong with her, and she wasn't cooperative at all and complaining. And then after they took her back, you could still hear her screaming and complaining with the people clear back, I don't know how far back it was, in the, in the area where they do the tests. And I thought, man, I'm glad I'm not like that. <laughs> Though I suppose sometimes in life I am. Yeah, she won't answer. She won't. <laughs> it seems the more that God gave Israel, the more ungrateful and hardened they became toward him. Modern scholars call that the progress paradox. The assertion that almost all aspects of Western life have vastly improved in the past century, and yet today most women, men and women feel less happy than in previous generations. We live in some of the most fantastic 
times, according to technology, but we're the least happy, least satisfied, and the least thankful and least grateful of times. Radical sociologists are a prime example of an unthankful people. They believe they are owed something just for existing, just because I'm here, just because I'm on this earth, just because of accidental forces of evolution have put me on the face of the earth, somebody owes me something. That, that's their attitude. And they don't get their something for nothing that they believe that they're owed. They grumble. They grouse and eventually take what they want. And in the process of it, they'll burn their own homes down. They'll burn their own cities down. Instead of working to make things better, they work to make things worse. How sad that is. So how can we avoid such illogical and unbalanced thinking and behavior in our lives? We can't control them, and certainly, listen, we don't want to control them, do we? Because we don't want them to control us. We want that freedom. But, but we want an ordered liberty. We want, we want to be able to live in a way that God wants us to live and that God will bless us and that we can serve God. How can we translate thanksgiving into thanks living? Well, one of the critical factors is focus, right? We need to focus on the good things. We need to focus on what we have, not on what we don't have. There are a lot of things that I don't have, and you know what? Most of them I don't need in the first place. I just don't need them. We're living in a culture of extreme commercialization of everything. In the past, most people considered poor by today's standards did not think they were poor. It's one of the sad things. I, Karen and I grew up in Appalachia supposed to be one of the poorest places on the face of the earth, especially in the United States of America, so much so that, that uh, President Johnson had to start the Appalachian Project. But you got to go tell these people, you got to help these people that they are so poor they don't know that they're poor. Goes in and, hey, what happens? Well, you're poor. Oh, I didn't know it. Well, the, the government's here to help you. And of course, what did Ronald Reagan say? The, the worst words, you know, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. Was that the eight, like eight worst words you could hear? Yeah, look what happened to Appalachia. It's still poverty reigns because they don't let people develop it. The people weren't upset that they were poor. Most people that we knew were happy. Media, especially television, has shown us all the things we simply cannot do without. Consumerism is a large part of our economy. You realize that in the latter stages of the Roman Empire, there was not a farm or a factory within a hundred miles of the capital. That was Rome. It was considered uh, bad taste, I guess. It was considered we, we don't want such things as a factory. We don't want something such as a farm. Anybody that lives in the capital, anybody that lives around Rome, uh, should feast on what is produced outside of Rome, kind of like Washington, D.C. today. What's well, made in Washington, D.C. except laws and money? <laughs> you know? Uh, what is it? Uh, the counties around Washington, D.C. are the richest parts of the world today. But they don't make anything but laws and regulations and rules. How sad that is. The government gave them free bread and entertainment back in, in, uh, in Rome. The rest of the empire struggled to survive and pay taxes. The people of Rome fought it beneath themselves to do any kind of manual labor. Uh, like the children of Israel, they were not content with what they were given. At the same time, they were unthankful and demanding of more. We want more circuses. We want more blood sport. And like the young people on TikTok today, <laughs> it's amazing. You can go on there, you can find uh, young people complaining they can't find a job except they have to work 
eight hours a day in a job starting off and they're not getting paid $200,000 a year. Well, you know what? The devil does not want us to be content. And the devil works hard to make sure that we're not content. Hebrews 13.5, we're warned or encouraged. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, that's the Lord, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But we can leave him and we can forsake him, so we've got to be very careful. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9-10, through 10, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Now look at that. Paul, writing in the first century, in the first 40 years of the church, said that many in the church, in the faith, had already wandered away because of this very thing. The desire to be rich. And probably thinking that, that Christianity was a way to become rich. And that, uh, you know, what would he think today of some of these televangelists and what they're doing? How sad it is. We need to focus on being a blessing, not just getting a blessing. Some think Christianity is about getting something, receiving material things, and, and again, go back to the televangelists. That's what they tell you. Uh, you'll be rich. You'll have this and you'll have that. And that creeps into the Lord's church at times also. They come to God so that he might serve them instead of them serving God. Like the celestial butler. I believe that's what C.S. Lewis would talk about. They perceive God as a celestial butler. Go get this for me. Go get that for me. Have, have this for me, for me. Oh, God wants us to come to Christ not to get a blessing, to, to be, but to become a blessing. A blessing to others and giving our wealth, resources, time, and energy, that becomes a blessing to us. You know, as I mentioned before, you know, when we pray for somebody else and we pray for those around us, that automatically makes our life better. When we pray for our nation, that makes our lives better because when God answers those prayers in a positive way, that lifts us up also. People who do not have a lot can be amazingly generous. Why? Because it's just not about money. It's about a lifestyle. Uh, in Mark chapter 9 and verse 41, Jesus said, For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Now, that's somebody giving to a disciple, but listen, if somebody giving to a disciple helps them, Oh, what does it do for a disciple to give somebody just a cup of cold water when they need it because they're thirsty? Well, that's kind of that laying up treasures in heaven theory, right? So I'm going to be there later. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, as Paul talks to the church at Corinth about the, the gift for the uh, church in Judea that's undergoing the famine. A, a famine in times when the church was in difficult circumstances anyhow because to become a Christian in uh, Jerusalem and Judea meant that uh, in the legal sense you become a non-person. You couldn't have a job, your family disowns you, you lose your property, <laughs> and then a famine comes along. <laughs> That's pretty tough, isn't it? Here's what Paul says. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has, been, that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. Hmm, excuse me. And this, not as we expected, 
but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Yeah, that's where it starts. We give ourselves to the Lord. We say, I want to become the Lord's servant. I don't want the Lord to serve me. I want to serve the Lord. Then as we serve the Lord, then we're able to reach out and serve others and overflow into a wealth of generosity because the Lord backs it up, you know, in, in our, on our currency. Uh, most of it says, in God we trust. Well, that should be the way it is. Not, not that we trust the currency, but that we trust God. <coughs> Excuse me. And some people have more than they could possibly spend, but still they want more. Now listen, I, I, I can understand the concept of capitalism. And that concept of capitalism is you've got to reinvest, you've got to keep things going. If you didn't, if people just took money and stuffed it in their mattress, well, there wouldn't be jobs for other people. There, there is that aspect of it where capitalism keeps things going, and you, you need to spread that wealth around. But that's the purpose of it, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there also comes that point of generosity within it that, that God expects of everybody. Everybody, <clears throat> excuse me, and frequently the things we want are the things that we really don't need. And Jesus talked about that in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Well, life, life is pretty precious, we think. But understanding that, that this life is temporary, this life is transitory, we're just moving on to another life, we're, we're moving on to the spiritual and into the eternal, that, uh, that there are just some things here that we don't really need. And if, if and like we talked about, who oh, was it last Wednesday evening? You know, if, if I live to eat, then I'm in trouble. If I eat to live, then it changes my perspective on a whole lot of things. So, and there are people out here that that's, that's what they do. They live to eat. That's their whole deal. And boy, if that meal just isn't right, they're going to complain and gripe and grouse like that woman I was talking about you know, at the beginning of the lesson. Uh, no. It's, there are fundamental things in life that we've got to take care of first. And if we take care of those fundamental things in life like the Lord is, has talked to us about like, and, and shown us in His Word, that, that straight and narrow gate that we talked about, or the straight gate and the narrow way that we talked about on that path, then life is going to be a little bit better for us. Mark chapter 10, verses 43 through 45, Jesus said, It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Well, why? Tell me why. why what, what sense does that make in this world? Well, here's the sense. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. We claim to be disciples of Christ. That means we are in an apprenticeship program to live and to believe and to teach and to act as he did all those things. And he came to serve, not be served. So fundamentally, what are we here for? To serve, not to be served. John Kennedy, the president, said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Do our re prayers reflect more upon what we want from God or what we are thankful for? Is our relationship with God more about what we expect from Him or what He expects from us? And millions of people pray to God for things, but then especially worship in prayer and, and, and spirit and truth. It's just... Again, back to that, they think of God as a spiritual butler. God is, yeah, he's here to serve us, but 
not like the genie in the bottle that we can just rope a lamp and pull him up whenever we need him. He's something a whole lot more than that. We need to focus on eternal things, not just earthly things. Life is good. Right? Amen? Life Amen. is good, but life can also be very difficult here. Problems arise. Losses and setbacks occur. Disaster strikes. If this world was all we have, then we might have reason to despair. Be like that woman I talked about earlier. Okay? She doesn't sound like she had a very good life, does she? No. But Paul reminds us, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. We serve a Savior who has overcome the world and who is preparing a place for us in His glory. So we have a future and we have a hope We've got nothing really to despair about. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Uh, Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. Okay, if I'm, if I'm not to be anxious about anything, what can I be anxious about? Okay. Remember, anxiety is not worry. Anxiety is not concern. What is the difference? Okay? I am concerned about certain things in life. And I worry about certain things in life. But when I can become anxious about something, it overwhelms me. And that's the totality of my life. I, I'm so concerned or so anxious about X all I can think about is X. My whole life is just consumed by X, whatever it is. And if that's the case, I'm, I've got a problem there. So do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, that means there's, there are things that are true out here. Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Don't think about bad things. Don't think about evil things. Don't think about how can I jump ahead of the line. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're, we're here to enjoy Thanksgiving meal. How, how do I get to the front of the line? You know, it's, you know, how do I get the turkey leg? <laughs> Don't think on those things. Think about how can I be the person that God wants me to be? Because that's the highest, that's the noblest, that's the most honorable. That's the most pure, lovely, commendable, true thing that is there. Conclusion. <coughs> it's easy to be thankful one day a year. The challenge for us is to practice thanks living every day of our lives. Not just saying we're thankful, and not just going to God in prayer saying thank you, but actually living out the terms of thanksgiving. Maybe that's a challenge for us. Maybe this would have been better on New Year's Eve. But too late now, isn't it? Thanksgiving Eve. Good sermon. Thanks for living. Let's practice thanks living as much as we can this year, every day of our lives. All right. Thank you so very much for your time and attention. Lessons yours. If you've got a need, let your request be made known as we stand and sing the invitation song. <laughs>